when most boys grow up, at some point they start liking girls. And as most girls grow up, at some point they start liking boys. But it doesn't always happen that way. We're going to talk about this on the next edition of Coming Out. Welcome back to part two of Coming Out, a special series produced by Whitehorse Media that is dealing with homosexual issues, lesbian issues, the Bible, Jesus Christ, and God's love and grace for all. I'm here now with Mike Carducci, who is also a co-founder, one of the co-founders of Coming Out Ministries. Uh, he's traveled quite a ways to get here, and we just want to, again, um, as I welcomed Wayne, I welcome you. Thank you for for joining us for this uh, special, special program. Thank you, Steve. It's awesome to be here. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to have you. We don't know each other that well, but feel a connection. Oh, you will. <laughs> a connection in Christ. Right. Uh, we don't have the same background, mm -hmm. but there is a verse in the Bible in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that says that all have sinned mm. and come short of the glory of God. So whatever uh, sin we've fallen into, we all have a common bond, <laughs> whatever it is. Mm -hmm that we are sinners and that we need, we need a savior. Amen. Amen. Uh, Mike, one thing I want to ask you, which I was going to ask Wayne, but I forgot, and that is, is this kind of content uh, really appropriate for kids? I'm sure there's parents that are watching this and maybe they're wondering, um, you know, should I let my 10-year-old or my 12-year-old or my, my eight-year-old mm. uh, sit in on this series? So right. what's your thought on that? Well. One thing I've found, Steve, is you know the more places that I speak, and and we've even spoken at, at grade schools, you know seventh grade and and younger. But what we found is that the kids are getting an education, whether you're in charge of it or not, you know from the school and uh, the things that they you know handheld devices that have access to the internet. And what we found is that if a parent is willing to to watch this and and to encourage dialogue afterwards what you start doing is taking the dirtiness out of it and, and the child can actually find a connection to the parent to start being open and to you know start to get healing if they've been defiled and, and also to to give them tools that if something does happen or if they start to have questions or temptations that they've already got this uh, established relationship where they can open up dialogue with their parent mm -hmm. I, I think it would be very beneficial sure but of course maybe a parent would want to view the the, the content uh, first, sure, sure. and, and, and obviously, decision. obviously, parents have to make their own decisions. We certainly leave it up to your conscience, but I think the reality is that uh, there's a whole host of kids out there that are already being exposed to things that uh, are not not good and are not being presented in a biblical way. And so, for a large percentage of kids, we think that this is something that they probably really do need to hear. And we will do our best, by the grace of God, to keep things as clean as possible. You know, we all have uh, dirtiness in our past that mm. we don't want to, you know, take a bath in. But there are things we do need to talk about right. because we need to relate to uh, our fellow sinners mm. in the world who struggle with things that are very real and that uh, need to be talked about. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're doing this. So again, thank you for being here. And uh, Mike, Mike, why don't you just, you know, go back and start telling us your story. I know that with, in Wayne's case, uh, as he looks back, he had a very difficult time with mm -hmm. his, his mother. Mm -hmm. And I understand that with you, it was really your, your father. So time is yours. Just okay. start All talking, right. <laughs> share. Well, w when I came back to God, I, um, I wanted to know why this thing had come to me. And, you know, I thought that I was born gay from my earliest moments. I, I remember uh, liking to do what girls like to do. I liked dressing up in my mom's clothes and playing with dolls. And, and I had three sisters. Uh, so basically, uh, when I put that to God, he started to answer me through different uh, sermons that I was hearing and going to camp meeting. And one of the things that, uh, that I found was this thing called defensive detachment. 
And so they talk about how every child is born with wet cement. You know, they're, they have no identity, masculine or feminine. But what happens is as a little boy turns to like a year old, between a year old and three years old, what happens is the little boy starts to identify that he doesn't have, you know, the same parts that mom has, but he has the same parts that dad has. So in a healthy relationship, the little boy starts wearing baseball caps backwards because that's what his dad wears, or, or he starts wearing cowboy boots because that's what dad does. And so he starts to make this, this connection or transference from the mother to the father, and that helps to harden the cement in the masculine. So at For the a time, boy. Excuse me? For a boy. Right, right. And then with the girl, right. And so the girl, it's different. It's different. But um, some of the same gender identity uh, mix-up happens, I think, at an early age. Uh, for me, what happened is when my father was around, he was in the Navy. He began. What state? What state were you in? Uh, Where'd you grow up? South Carolina, South a little Carolina. bit, then okay. Virginia. And you had you had a mother that was yep. in your home and your father, but you didn't see him as much. Right. Dad would be gone sometimes three to six months at a time on a cruise, and so at a time when I needed that that example, he wasn't available. So for me, even though the reality was he was you know, providing for his family and, and doing what his job was, for me, I viewed that as abandonment. But then when my dad was home, he was this hot-headed Italian, he was abusive in his discipline, and so, so for me, I looked at that and I thought, if that's my, my gender identity, no thank you. And the only uh, option that I had was my mother. So um, I had the three sisters, there was no other male in the home to give me an example of what that looked like. And so there was this deficit, but I didn't know how to fix it. And so I reverted back to my mother. I started playing with dolls. And, and I believe that what happened is my cement became affirmed in the feminine. And so I didn't know how to change it. I didn't know how to fix it. And so then when I went to school and the kids started to see that, you know, hey, the kids got some issues and they started to call me sissy, queer, faggot, you know, all of those terms. What that did is that pushed away masculinity even further. And what, from what age would you say that was? From the earliest I can remember. I can't even give you an age. Thing. And was this a Christian school? Um, no, not necessarily. No, no public uh, school. You went to public right, schools. Right. I didn't go. I didn't become a Christian until I was about 14. Um, but I knew who God was, and I believed that God was there. I even prayed that God would change me. I, I prayed that the next morning I'd wake up as, as a girl, and I thought, well, that would be the problem fixed. But he didn't, didn't understand how this gender identity was something that was broken and how to fix it. And so for a little kid, I was just going through the motions, very frustrated, uh, unable to relate to not only my gender, but, but knew that I was different, knew so that you, there was you something. you felt like you should have been a girl. Mm -hmm. You felt Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And, do you, and do, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Uh -huh. uh, I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but I know people say, well, some say it's, it's your genes. Mm -hmm. Some say it's what's going on with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And then others say, well, you know, maybe it n might not be either one of those, but as you grow older, when you get to be you know, a teenager, you're exposed to more of the influence of Hollywood, uh -huh. and you just uh, you check it out. Right. So there's various uh, opinions about why a person has same-sex attractions. Mm -hmm. in, in your case, as you look back, do you see it as really a father issue uh, that that was that contributed to your feelings for a man mm -hmm. and wishing that you were a girl? Is that? It became so clear to me uh, actually in my 40s after I'd come back to the Lord and was walking in church culture. Um, it, it was all of a sudden that I started to realize that that from my earliest thoughts, I remember not not necessarily being gay, not having an attraction to the same sex, but I the feeling that I wanted to be a girl, that I thought that I should have been a girl. And if I'd have had a sex change at an early age, which they're doing now, 14, 15 year old uh, boys are having sex changes into a girl and vice versa. If that would have happened for me, because what happened is when I came out into the gay culture at 19 years old and 20, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, all of that gender dysphoria left me. I realized that, that masculinity was more valuable in gay culture than, than not. And so if I'd had a sex change, I can't even imagine how much more complicated that would have been for me, but um, I do realize that there was this this change, and I didn't know how it came. Um, but as I asked God to show and to reveal that to me, I realized that that um, that this was something that had happened before I was even conscious, and I wasn't in charge mm -hmm. of that. And, and um, that was incredible insight that that the and Lord gave you, me at that age. As you were growing up, were you reading the Bible? Did you go to church? Did you hear <laughs> well, scripture? You said that you were praying and asking mm -hmm. God to change you into a girl, and you thought, well, hey, if he would just do that, then all my I'd problems be would be solved. Right. Where did you learn uh, about praying? I mean, I look uh -huh. at, back at my life growing up in the Hollywood Hills, and um, I, I really, I 
pretty much connected with my mom and then uh -huh. definitely connected with my dad. And when I became a teenager, I was definitely attracted to girls. But I was having a hard time controlling that mm -hmm. uh, as I got into my teenage years because we didn't have the Bible. We didn't pray. We didn't, we didn't talk about Jesus at all. So I was pretty much on my own mm -hmm. to deal with all these emotions and these uh, feelings and desires mm -hmm. that pretty much got the better of me until mm -hmm. I was 20. Then I read the Bible, and that's when everything changed. So wow. I'm interested, you know, what, how did the Bible get in there? How did you even know how to pray? I wouldn't have known to pray yeah. when I was 12 years old. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was raised as a Catholic as a young person, and I, I went to catechism every week, and uh, I really didn't join the uh, Protestant church until I was about 15. My father okay. had um, an affair with a, a backslidden Christian, and they got together, and that's kind of how we got into uh, the, how the Protestant message got into our, our family. But I did know God at an early age, and I saw him as punitive, arbitrary, um, just kind of like I saw my dad. Uh, dad wasn't really available to me, and so the only way that I could relate to a God who called himself Father was I guess he had the same attributes as the Father that I had. I so, so even though I prayed that he would change my, my uh, gender, um, I still saw him as arbitrary, judgmental. The same things that I had rejected from my father, I saw God that way. I, I always knew that God existed, and I believed in him, but I basically thought that he didn't care much for me. He wasn't very a, a, appealing. Well, he, and yes, and he you. wasn't available he was just, to me. Uh, right. He was just an authority out right. there that you better do the right thing or else. And yeah. there was no, there was no compassion in his heart for you. You didn't feel that. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah. Wow. Now I, another another question. Um, personally, I wish that in this series, uh, you know, we interviewed mm -hmm. Wayne. We're interviewing you. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Pastor Ron Woolsey who will be coming next, sharing his story. I wish that we had a lady that it just didn't work out, mm. but to have her share her story because homosexuality, lesbianism, um, I know that women are complicated, but do you think that there's some of the same issues going yes. on with women who, mm -hmm. as they're growing up, eventually they choose or feel mm -hmm. uh, attraction to another, another woman and with men with men? Right. You know, I'd like to just ask you that question. Right. Um I can't really speak specifically, but I have other friends that have come out of the lesbian lifestyle. And one story that, that impresses me in particular is this, this girl was raised um, not receiving the love from her father. But mm -hmm. the father lavished a lot of attention on her older brother. And so she thought that if she was a better boy, they, that see. her father would love her more. And so that started to do this gender dysphoria mm -hmm. for her as well. She started to become, you know, more boy-like and wearing boys' clothes and, and had the same gender dysphoria that I had experienced. And so you, each one of us has incredibly different uh, scenarios or, or, you know, experiences that shaped us, and yet some of the things are very similar as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I also understand that there was a, a, a moment or an event of major trauma for mm -hmm. you that contributed to your eventual plunge, a choice, mm -hmm. diving in mm. to a, uh, a gay lifestyle. And just elaborate on that a little bit, this traumatic event <laughs> that you okay. told me that you had. Yeah. Well, the traumatic event was actually when I was a, a junior in high school, in a boarding school. And uh, the roommate that I got, uh, I didn't know anyone at the school, and so the roommate I got was experienced in juvenile detention, and he was there basically court ordered and he recognized things in me uh, I'm sure and you know one night the wrestling turned into something more and I had my first homosexual experience uh, there in this Christian boarding school mm -hmm. and I remember what was so traumatic for me Steve was that when I went to bed that night I realized that indeed I was the one thing that everyone that accused me of being that I had gone to bed that night and it affirmed to me that I indeed was gay and, and that God couldn't help me or that he didn't help me. And I remember going to bed and thinking that it actually satisfied something in me. It actually, I, I think what was so shocking was that it affirmed to me that I indeed was attracted to this. Um, and so I remember, you know, going into uh, the next uh, Bible conference that they had at the school. I gave my heart to the Lord. I got a girlfriend. I started to do all the right things. My roommate got kicked out. But um, even at 17, I prayed that the Lord would take my life. I said, I don't want to live like this. And um, I asked him to take my life, right, mm. if that was the closest we were going so to you were, So it was a conflict. I mean, you recognized that you, part of you liked, liked it, but another yes. part of you said, I don't want this. Right, right. Lord, take it out of me. And yes. you still had desires to follow Jesus. Right. But I was still addicted to, um, to masturbation and fantasy. And that had happened at, a, at 13 years of age. And so because it not only was that same-sex attracted, but um, I believe that I wasn't 
um, I believe that that actually was was something that was keeping God from being able to help me even more because the process wasn't about becoming straight. I was praying for the wrong thing. What I wanted, what I needed, I believe, was that I needed to understand and to be affirmed by masculinity. I needed to know what, what uh, masculine affirmation was and gender identity was that wasn't sexualized. And so by the time I was 20 years old, I went out into the gay lifestyle. I was so desperate to have this affirmation, this, uh, this this intimacy with a man, whether it was sexualized or not, I, I was definitely seeking it. And in Proverbs 27, verse 7, it talks about to somebody that just had a full meal that you don't need dessert. But to somebody who's starving, even something bitter will taste sweet. And so that was the driving force for me. I had this demand to be filled by masculine love because I didn't know how to get it in a legitimate way. I ended up going into the gay bars and uh, my first experience with uh, the first boyfriend that I had was actually that I was raped. And uh, I didn't even realize that into my 40s after coming out of all this, realizing that I was so desperate for any time or attention that this person gave me that I actually was willing to be submitted to this rape several times. And, um, and, and I didn't even realize the connection until after coming out of it that regardless mm -hmm. of this drive that I had within me, it, it, still, um, it still turned out to be this rape. So how many years would you say you openly lived that life? 20 years. 20 years. Mm -hmm. And as we got near the end of the 20 years, what happened to end those 20 years yeah. and begin a new, a new period in your life? Right. Um, I was hoping to have a monogamous relationship. I thought that, that if I could have a monogamous relationship that God would bless it and that that would be the best that I could do. Because with, a, he, with a man or mm -hmm. a woman? Yes, with a man. Okay, you right. wanted a monogamous relationship with a man. Right. Okay. And so um, the first relationship that I was in, it was a guy that was about nine years older than me, and he introduced me to all kinds of uh, uh, sexual behaviors, and eventually within, I'd say within two years, I become a sexual addict, acting out sexually. In the five relationships that I was in in the 20 years, I was never faithful. And um, what was this driving force, all I really wanted to be was affirmed by a man, but what happened is it got twisted somehow and, and the enemy was able to use that and to create this addiction that, um, that I was never able to break, never able to be uh, monogamous in any of the relationships so, I was in. So what changed? What, what changed that? Wow, a lot. So you anyway, one, the short version. Right, right, right. So anyway, the, the night before I got baptized, I'd, I'd made my stand for the Lord. How did you decide to get baptized? Oh, it's, it's a long time. <laughs> uh, my sister had gotten remarried to her ex-husband. I saw the Holy Spirit in him. I came back to Florida. My other sister invited me to an evangelistic series, and I didn't realize it, but my sisters had been praying. And, and to anyone who... Um, who's praying for their loved ones or whatever, I just want to really encourage them that intercessory prayer, it works because it pulled me out. So anyway, I was in a relationship with this millionaire, good-looking uh, guy that had big blue eyes and a convertible Mercedes. And I mean, I was at the top of my game and, and what happened is um, my sister invited me to an evangelistic series. And I don't know why, but I went. And so on the last night of the evangelistic series, I made a stand to be baptized. And my sister asked me outside in the parking lot what I was going to do about my boyfriend. And I looked at her and I said, I'm gay. I was born this way. I tried to change. I asked God to change me. That never happened. I said, all I know is that Jesus loves me for who I am. I said, and that's why I'm getting baptized. And my sister stopped. And the next day I was baptized with a sexual addiction and a boyfriend. But I began this journey with Jesus Christ. And even in my ignorance and even in everything that had happened to me, um, it's like the Lord was very slowly revealing to me the different things that had defiled me, the different ways that the enemy had put knots in my ropes. And, and, and very slowly, the Lord was able to unravel those knots. And it took, it took time. There was no, you know, being magic wand over my head and I was uh, straight and ready to date and mate and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It, it was so it a process. An, it wasn't an instant cure. No. Yeah. And, and, you know, Steve, I really struggled because... Um, I thought that I was doing something wrong. Again, thinking that, that, that um, I had to be perfect or that I had to be good, I didn't recognize that it was Christ's goodness in me that gave me victory, and that took a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I read recently that the Christian life is not, it's not an elevator where you mm -hmm. get in and you go to the top floor. Uh -huh. it's, it's a stair, stairway, so you go step by step. God right. takes you where you are, and even though we're all messed up in lots of ways, all of us, God works with us step by step. And he, he changes us, uh, maybe not as fast as we would like to be changed, but if we 
stick with it mm -hmm. and keep trusting him and keep following the Bible and choosing that we want in Jesus more than uh, some of our own desires, uh, which, which may not be right. Right. So, Steve, then if, where was that information? I, I could have used that because I thought that I, I needed to get baptized again or maybe I needed to get anointed again because I was looking for this instant change. I didn't realize that this was a process because God knew that it was going to take time to change my understanding about Him mm -hmm. and about the Father. And so He couldn't give it to me all at once because I couldn't mm -hmm. handle that. So He gave it to me as step I could handle step. it. That's right. And it was always my decision. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, in, in other ministries or whatever, uh, look at my colleagues and I and they say that we're still gay. And you know, that's not the case because this has always been my decision. God never forced me to choose. And you know what? It'd be easier to just stay the way that I was. But what was so incredible, as I walked with God, He only gave me what I could handle. And, and at my decision, it was always my choice to, to continue or to not. And what's incredible is He's always respected my right to choose. And so today, mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. you went 20 years, you grew up, and you went 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then it's been how long since you came out since 13. you, 13 years. Yes. So, and now today, uh, God has continued to change you. Mm -hmm. He's doing wonderful things in your life. And you are now part of Coming Out Ministries. Just uh -huh. tell us in a nutshell, uh, what is Coming Out Ministries? You know, from your perspective, your heart, uh -huh. what's your burden? What's your message? What are you doing now? And you know, give us just a quick, okay. quick recap. <laughs> so when we started um, this ministry and, and the Lord started moving me just by invitations to come and speak, just about my, my history of coming out of the homosexual lifestyle, what I realize now is that homosexuality is no different, according to the Bible, than, than any other sexual sin. And what we've done in Christian society is we've taken homosexuality out and, and we've made it this entity of its own. But basically, from what I understand in the Bible and the responses that I get when I speak, is that homosexuality is no different and it ends up back in the lump with all the other sexual sin and that God has to have the answer for that. Because my struggle was not only uh, for just homosexual feelings and, and, and identity, but it was al also over sexual sin, the pornography and, and the addiction, the sexual addiction. Whenever I speak, I speak to pastors, I speak to young men, uh, young women, uh, older men, older women, singles ministries, men's ministries, academies and universities. And what I find is the same issue that I had mm -hmm. is the same issue that many young men and women at, of any age have is the struggle with sexual sin. And what I find is that the answer is still the same. And, and mm -hmm. so it isn't specific to one uh, area or another, what I find is that this ministry really uh, speaks to all of us. And are you, are you really different today than what you were 30 years ago? Oh, absolutely. You're I, not the same man. No, no, uh-uh. You're as, genuinely as a matter of fact, changed, even right, though you're probably right. not done. You know, I heard somebody once say that uh, God doesn't take us out of the oven half-baked. Uh -huh. He has a lot of work to do with us, and he's working with me, and he's working with you, but, mm -hmm. but you know in your own mind and your heart that you've made a lot of progress. <laughs> Steve, the hardest thing has been, has been this, this constant surrender. I have to surrender myself every day. I don't have the luxury of surrendering myself once in the morning and being good for the rest of the day. I have to surrender myself constantly throughout the day to my thoughts, my feelings. And, and Philippians mm -hmm. 2 verse 5 is, is for me, you, you can hang most of, of my whole ministry on that verse alone. What does it say? And it's call, it says, let, them, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. And to me, that's invitational. It's saying, give me permission to let my mind inside your mind. And so whether that has to do with uh, thoughts of masturbation or pornography or, or even same-sex attraction, what happens is if I give God permission, and that's what I've been practicing, is I'll say, Lord, I'm giving you permission to take these thoughts because if you don't take these thoughts, I know that they're going to take me to a place that you say mm -hmm. I shouldn't go. And so when I give him permission, the one time that it happened, I was stepping into the shower and, and the thought to, you know, to indulge in sin came. And just then the Holy Spirit spoke and said, why don't you claim that promise? And I said, I'm giving you permission, Lord, to take these thoughts, because if you don't, I'm going to indulge in sin, right? And what was so incredible is my next thought was about baseball. And I hate baseball. <laughs> what was so incredible is that God took me immediately where I was. He gave me victory immediately. I didn't have to step out of the shower and, and fast for five days and, and look up you know, scriptures for an hour to get the relief that I was seeking. He was an immediate God <laughs> unto him who is able to keep yeah. you from falling, right? A present help in time of trouble. Right. So, Mike, mm -hmm. are you happier now? 
today than you were when you lived uh, an openly gay gay lifestyle? Well, it, it almost seems, um, it doesn't seem even genuine to just say yes. It's Steve, infinitely better yeah. is my life now than it's ever been in, it, before. And even though I'm under incredible scrutiny and, and criticism, mm -hmm. I can still tell you that I would rather be in the arms of Jesus now than the arms of the gay lifestyle. Well, when Wayne was here and we were discussing his story, I could hear mm -hmm. you in the background uh, before we were on the camera with uh -huh. Wayne. I could hear you singing and humming your, you know, Christian songs. Like my little boy, he's, uh, he's nine years old and I heard him just singing about Jesus around the house the other day and it uh -huh. threw up my heart and I, I heard the same thing from you. Uh -huh. Said it just shows me that you are genuinely happy mm -hmm. with your life and happy to be here, happy to share your story and that this is very uh, real to you and wow. that God is real to you. And is that, you know, if you could put it in a nutshell, your message now is you're out there mm -hmm. uh, in colleges, universities, academies, young people, older people, with pastors sharing your story. What, in a nutshell, would you say your message is? The message really is about getting to know God. It's invitational. He's, mm -hmm. he's wanting us to know Him on such an intimate level. And you know what? When I started to see Him on an intimate level, then it started to give me uh, the desire to want to let go of the things that yeah. define myself. And, and, and as I sought Him more and more, what happened is things started to fall off no matter where I went. And, and I started to see the victorious life that I could have in Him. And I thought that it came at a huge sacrifice to give up the things that I loved. But really, when I started to let those go, the things that I received, Ooh. Steve, they were more powerful wow. and better and stronger than I'd ever experienced before. Wonderful. So God is not just a... The, uh, the father figure you used to think of mm -hmm. him as being, but now he's no. a God of love who's changed your life. Well, we're winding down here with uh, program two. We've got another testimonial. Uh, Pastor Ron Woolsey will be next. I can't help but go back to this verse, or I want to go back to the verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that talks about God who has called you. He's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Uh, I've got my story. Mike has his story, Wayne has his story, Pastor Ron has his story, and there are many other stories that uh, we can share, that we know of, and that other people can share about how God is good and that His light is, is marvelous. Amen. He can change our lives, He can heal us, He can forgive us and give us peace and power to live for Him. So don't go away, we've got another program, uh, part three of Coming Out, so join us again. If you would like to order the 13-part Coming Out series for $34.95 plus shipping, call 1-800-782-4253 or write to Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 1139, Newport, Washington, 99156. Pastor Ron Wolsey, Wayne Blakely, and Mike Carducci are each available to conduct a seminar in your area. To schedule a speaking engagement, contact Coming Out Ministries by calling 360-936-8514 or visit comingoutministries.org.